I'd like to welcome you. If you've been attending our sessions, you know how wonderful they are, like all the good things that ATA does. We'd love to have you join ATA and support uh, not only these programs, but all of the other things we do. And I know that you will enjoy our wonderful journal, Topical Time. Just wanna alert you that next Saturday, we have a really special exhibit or exhibit. It is an exhibit, but a presentation from Carol Ed Holm on the peafowl, or as most of us would say, the peacock. And I have seen some of her amazing collection. The stamps are gorgeous and you will love it. And then on the 23rd, we have Felix Perez Fulch talking about his mother's favorite stamp, the 150th anniversary of Mississippi. This is also a beautiful stamp. And if you've attended Felix's presentations before, you know you are always going to learn and you're always going to laugh. So please help us wind up our series of, by attending Felix's talk on the 23rd. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Don. We have three creative collectors to talk about how they formed interesting and fun small collections on unusual topics. First one up is Michelle Bresso, who will show us a collection based on a tongue-in-cheek su tongue suggestion that became a reality, guinea pigs on stamps. Michelle is a college professor of communication who collects see, all sorts of things. <laughs> She's a member of Women Collectors, EPS, Cats on Stamp Study Unit and the Knoxville Philatelic Society. Michelle will also be be driving the uh, the PowerPoint for this for this exhibit. Uh, Susan Jones will be showing us how interested it is to learn about both the topic and related stamps for their presentation on Miria Sibella Marian, artist, scientist, and explorer. Susan is a retired geologist with eclectic collecting interests. She's an ATA board member, exhibits competitively, and is president of the Spring Hill Stamp Club in West Dundee, Illinois. Our third presenter is our own executive director, Jennifer Miller, who has a love, who has had a love of Winnie the Pooh since childhood and has a, um, a great mini topic devoted to Winnie the Pooh. On that note, I will turn it over to Michelle. Eric, thank you. And I'm gonna switch up the order a little bit, but while I'm telling you about that, that I'm going to share my screen so that you can see our PowerPoint. And uh, we will have Sue up first, Jennifer next, and then I will bat cleanup. So Sue, take it away. I am happy to do that. So many topics get started in a variety of ways. And if, next slide. Mine started with a first day cover by my favorite first day cover artist, Mer uh, Carol Gordon. In this case, it's the one of three caches that she did for the Marion Botanical Print stamps. And the cover is on, one of the covers is on the left. And Carol often uses famous women, selects stamps of famous women to highlight on her caches. And I have to admit that I had never heard of Maria Sibylla Mirian until I saw this cover. But of course, like any good topical collector, I bought some stamps, read about Maria, collected a few first day covers. Uh, here you see a maximum card and that's how my mini topic evolved, got started. And it's what I'm going to present to you today. This is a German stamp in the center about Maria, and it was issued in uh, a series issued between 1986 and 1989 on famous women. And it's the only one that depicts Maria herself. And the maximum card on the right is um, a portrait of Maria, a young, young woman. And it, you can see it's clearly the one that Carol Gordon used for her cachet. Now, why is Maria famous? Well, she's famous for three reasons. First, 
She blocked the secrets of metamorphosis through some very detailed observations, beginning with, as a child actually, collecting insects and studying them. When she pu first published, she revolutionized the art of scientific illustration, and I'll explain that later. And then some credit her with making the first purely scientific expedition. So first thing to note though, is look at the dates on the first day cover. She was born in 1647. And that's important because this is a time before science, as science was evolving as we think of it today, women were not particularly involved in science at that time. They were very few and far between as artists. And so this is, and certainly they never conducted scientific expeditions. So this is a very unusual woman in a very unusual time. Next. So Maria the scientist, she had published a few books of the illustrations of flowers called the flower books. This though is the book that made her reputation as a scientist. In 1679, she published this book, which has a 74 word, type, word title, but usually it's just referred to as the caterpillar book. And these changed both science and botanical illustration. If you look at the image on the left, what she contributed to science in both these illustrations and her the text of this book is putting all of the life stages of an insect on a single page. Before you see pages with caterpillars and pages with moths or butterflies, pages of larvae and then separate pages of flies or some other ins beetles. So for the first time, she put the entire life cycle on a page, which pretty much proved that metamorphosis was a real process and that caterpillars and the resulting moth or, or butterfly were the same species. What she did for botanical illustration is illustrated in both the black and white tulip and also the rose on the, uh, the in What she did here is illustrate the insects with a flower that they are associated with for food, or maybe it's what they put their, um, the larvae turned into a pupa on this particular plant. And they might look familiar to collectors of US stamps. Next because they served as the basis for these two stamps issued by the United States in 2015. On the left, you have vintage rose, and it was a forever stamp that paid the one cent rate at the time. And then on the right is the vintage tulip, and it pays the two ounce weight. And they are designed to be used on something like a wedding invitation where the Two ounce goes on the outer envelope. Inside that outer envelope, you have the invitation, the response card, and the RSVP card, and the envelope to send it, which would have the vintage rose forever stamp on it. Okay. After publishing the Caterpillar books, not yet, well, okay. After publishing the Caterpillar books, Maria's life took a very strange turn. By this time she was married, she had two daughters, but in 1685, she left her husband and moved into a religious com commune. And it's curious that not only did the commune reject her husband as a member, they refused to even allow him to come into the commune buildings. Maybe there was something going on in this marriage. I don't know. I have not read anything about that, but needless to say, she was separated from her husband. The commune started to fall apart about 1691, six years later, she moved to Amsterdam. And her husband forced her, and so she was forced to support herself by doing paintings, 
or uh, mixing and selling pigments to other artists and studying specimens of insects in the collections there. And that's how she gained interest in, access to an interest in the insects of the Dutch colony of Suriname. So on this slide, what you see is a portrait of Maria at the age of 50 with our same German stamp. There's a small map showing the location of Suriname on the north coast of South America. She went to Suriname and to stay five years, but she stayed 18 months. But it result when she returned, she published her most famous book, which is Metamorphosis of the Insects of Suriname. And I've showed you the title page there. And this book has been the source of many stamps of her work including two US stamps that were issued, the same two we saw on that first, first day cover. And this is the uh, cover of the ceremony program for the issuance of the Mirian Botanical Prints stamps by the US. Next. She really did want to study insects in the field. And as a result, uh, she published her Insects of Suriname, and the United States picked two of those to issue as stamps, booklet stamps, a 20 stamp booklet, 15 stamp vendable booklet shown here. And they represent, let me go down here, the bottom two first day covers are by Fred Collins. And the last one is based on the citron stamp and fruit. That, she, that Maria illustrated. And the one on the right is one of the two pineapple illustrations that appears in the uh, Insects of Suriname. I think they're just very pretty covers for, and they're very much in the style of Maria's work. And then on the right-hand side is another first day cover showing both stamps. And it is a picture of her, Carol, uh, Maria's other pineapple. This is pineapple with cockroaches. And so this one is not seen very often and certainly not used on anybody's stamps. Next. But it shouldn't be too surprising to any of us by now that with her most famous book being the Insects of Suriname, that that country has put out the most stamps with featuring Maria's work. And what this first set of five does is picks five of the examples and enlarges only the flower part of the illustration, reproduces it then as a stamp. And let's see, these were 19 issued 1981. And the one thing to note is unlike the US stamps, Suriname always gives credit to Maria Sibylla Mirian as the artist of the stamp. And you can see that in the text at the top of these stamps. Next. In 1983, Suriname issued two sets of 12 stamps. In January, they issued the floral stamps seen on the upper left. Then in September, they issued the insect series on the right. And one thing I want to point out, and that one only features insects, feature moths and butterflies only. And I wanted to point out though, that her Suriname paintings also show birds, reptiles, amphibians. And there are paintings and prints avail available that she possibly engraved herself, but certainly uh, drew the originals of and form part of the body of her work. Next. And this is the final set of stamps that Suriname issued. It came out in 1990. And as you see on the lower right, they were actually is issued as satenant pairs and they're triangle stamps. And again, they only feature the flowers from the insects of Suriname not any of the insects, unless they're incidentally tucked away inside one of those flowers. And again, she's given credit for, for creating the original art. 
next. And so anyway, I wanted to uh, end this uh, little mini talk on a mini collection uh, on a personal note. I discovered, I discover many topics very often. And I've also discovered that one topic or collection often leads to another topic or a collection. And as I put this presentation together, I realized that some thoughts were starting to form about the possibility um, of properly, possibly creating some another mini collection based on my real love of scientific illustration as an art form. Now, my very first art class was a graduate course in scientific illustration, and that has really influenced both my own artwork and I've discovered my collecting. So my collection is loaded with stamps such as these other two souvenir sheets. One is fossils drawn from books published about the same time as Maria's books. And it was issued by Denmark in uh, six, 1998. And these are historic books with historic illustrations. And then in 2018, I just fell in love with this, the stamp in the lower right of a little crinoid from Antarctica. And this was issued by the French Southern and Antarctic Territories. And like I said, suddenly I'm starting to see this whole possibility for either another little mini collection or possibly beyond that. So I'm just gonna end by saying, keep your eyes open. You're likely to see um, another talk or maybe an article or possibly even an exhibit based on scientific illustration. And that thought, I'd like to turn this over to, I believe Jennifer is our next speaker. Thank you, Sue. Very interesting. And yes, I agree. One often leads to many others. <laughs> so my topic today is Winnie the Pooh. And this is the guy right here that started it all. This is my first love, my, my Winnie the Pooh from my childhood. And he went with me everywhere, um, even a little past my childhood. Yes, he went to college with me. He went on all my vacations. Um, and yes, I still have him today. I carried him around and I loved off his mouth, his nose, his eyebrows. And um, eventually I even wore out his original red shirt, his red felt shirt. And I was very upset because he was then naked. So my wonderful grandma dug through her fabric bag and found a <clears throat> red, it's burgundy, piece of polyester, which of course is much more durable than felt, and created him this little red shirt. Um, and I was just so delighted. And because my grandma made it, it's extra special. And so I still have them today and still, I can't get, I can't part with him. Next, a writer named Alan, Alan Alexander Milne. A.A. A. Milne, as you probably know him, had a son named Christopher Robin Milne, who was born on August 21st, 1920. Christopher had a bear named Edward Bear. Well, how did the name Winnie the Pooh come about? In 1924, Milne wrote a book of children's poems titled, When We Were Very Young. In the introduction of this book, there is mention of a swan that Christopher Robin liked to feed in the mornings he named it Pooh. Milne explains when that, quote, when we said goodbye to the swan, we took the name with us as we didn't think the swan would want it anymore, end quote. In the introduction to the book, Winnie the Pooh, written in 1926, Milne writes about how Christopher loved to go to the zoo in London and see a certain bear. Now this bear's name is Winnie, which shows what a good name for bears it is. Winnie, and that's the picture there um, with the gentleman. Uh, Winnie was a Canadian black bear that had been purchased by Canadian Lieutenant Harry Colburn, a cavalry veterinarian. Colburn was en route to England during the First World War. He purchased the cub for $20 from a hunter who found him 
and he purchased it while he was at a train stop in White River, Ontario. He named the bear Winnie after his adopted hometown in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Winnie was secretly brought to England and gained unofficial recognition as a mascot of the Canadian Army Veterinary Corps. Colburn left Winnie at the London Zoo while he and his unit were in France. After the war, she was officially donated to the zoo as she had become a much loved attraction there. And that is where Christopher Robin encountered her and spent much time at the zoo. So Milne tells us one day that Edward Bear wanted an exciting name all to himself. So Christopher Robin at that point changed Edward's name to Winnie the Pooh. Next. The original stories of Winnie the Pooh were written by A. A. Milne in the books Winnie the Pooh, published in 1926, and The House at Pooh Corner. The original illustrations, or decorations as they are called in the book, were done by Ernest H. Shepard. This version of Pooh that you see here is often referred to as classic Pooh. Pooh has other friends that we meet in the stories, and we see some of them here. Rabbit, Piglet, Tigger, Eeyore, and Kanga. Not pictured are Roo, Roo which is Kanga's baby, and Owl. Pooh is often pictured with a pot of honey. He is often hungry and will visit his friends in hopes for an invitation to join them for a small smackerel of something. In 1930, a man named Stephen Schlesinger purchased the US and Canadian rights to Winnie the Pooh. Pooh was first shown in color wearing his red shirt in 1932. Schlesinger and then his wife, after he died, marketed Pooh for over 30 years, creating the first Pooh doll, record, board game, puzzle, US, US radio broadcast, which I had no idea, animation and motion picture. Next. In 1966, Disney purchased the rights to Pooh. Most of you are probably familiar with the Disney version of Pooh. They have produced many movies, TV shows, and lots of merchandise. Fun fact for you, Disney added another character to the Pooh stories, Gopher. In his first appearance, Gopher says, I'm not in the book, but I'm at your service. Now in the context, he's actually saying that he's not in the phone book, but it's a nod to the fact that he is not in the original books. This set of stamps that we see was issued by Canada for the 25th anniversary of Walt Disney World in Florida in October, 1996. I really like how it shows the story of Pooh. Next. And this shows the entire set that they, they issued. The bottom left there is the cover that contained the whole set. You can see Pooh peeking through the little circle there. And then there on the right is the souvenir sheet, the single there. At the top, it's kind of hard to tell, it was a booklet. On the left, you see the French version. And on the far right, you see the English version. And when it was one of those books where it flipped upside down, one half was English and you flipped it upside down and the other half was, was French. And then there was a sheet of stamps that was stapled to the outside of the book. And all of that was inside the little envelope. So I thought that was a really nifty little set. Um, next. These stamps are from Russia. Now these are supposed to be Pooh and Piglet. Piglet looks pretty much the same, but, but Pooh has definitely had a little, uh, little change in appearance there. So um, I just thought that was very interesting how different he looked, but it is supposed to be Winnie the Pooh. Next. The Milne family lived in London, but they bought a country home a mile from Ashdown Forest. The family and nanny went there often. They spent weekends there, a month in the spring and two months in the summer. The 100 acre wood is based on Ashdown Forest. These items are from Micronesia. 
the sheet shows a few places from the 100 acre wood. Now, of course, you can see all the characters there. At the bottom left is Pooh's house. And as the book tells us, Pooh lived under the name of Mr. Sanders, which means that the name was over his door and he lived under it. And then we have um, Kanga's house up there to the right. And you see there's two mailboxes, one for Kanga and one for Roo. Um, you can see Tigger and Eeyore. There's Rabbit and he's a very avid gardener. And then up at the top, you will note at the top right is Owl's house up in the tree. Um, we don't see Eeyore's house. He lives a ways away in a, a house of sticks that they helped him build. Um, okay, and next. These stamps were from Anquilla. They show various scenes from the Disney an animated movies. They were issued in February 1982 to celebrate the 100th anniversary of A.A. A. Milne's birth. Now, this is one of those things where some people might collect these and some people might not, uh, because you will find basically the same stamps issued by St. Vincent in March of 1998. They have a different border, and instead of ornaments, they have honey pots in the corner. So. Uh, but, but very interesting nonetheless. I like how there's such a sample of all the different stories from the Winnie the Pooh movies. Um, next. And then on my, my final page here, I just put a collection of Pooh items from around the world. Uh, he looks pretty much the same everywhere except for Russia. Um, and uh, I, just, I just thought they were a lot of fun stamps. In the Winnie the Pooh set, there are only 37 stamps that I could find um, that, that we have on our list. Actually, I found one more, so there's 38 now. Um, but as you can see, Pooh is world famous, and why not? For such a silly old bear, he's a lot of fun. So thank you very much. And now I will turn it over to Michelle. Well, thank you very much, Jennifer and Sue. I've already learned so much. Now, this topic is unexpected for all of us. I did not expect to be collecting guinea pigs at all. Never been a big fan. My daughter had one as a child. Don't tell anybody, but I was really happy when it finally passed away. I was thinking, we do not need this animal in our house. However, here I am with a guinea pig collection, and we have this person to thank. Yes, it's about Jennifer. You see, when ATA relaunched its new website, it had features uh, that they thought customers would like, but nobody had used them yet. And I came along and I thought, ooh, I wanna try that out because I'd like to buy this item from the site directly. Uh, it, it was an automatic setup, which we hadn't had before. And <clears throat> as it turned out, I wound up test driving for the first time several of the new features on this revised website. And one day is kind of a tongue in cheek thing. Uh, Jennifer said, well, you've become the official ATA guinea pig and sort of, you know, just a snide comment. I said, well, you know, uh, there, there ought to be a, a checklist for that. And then there was. Now, this is an example of a custom checklist. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but ATA can provide custom checklists for anybody who wants to, sorry, so much for my timer option, uh, wants to provide a checklist for anybody who would like to have a checklist, but there isn't one that exists currently. ATA for a reasonable fee will create a custom checklist for you and your topic. And one day in the mail, this checklist showed up, which was just really awesome for me. Uh, it has about 24 stamps on it uh, with guinea pigs. And so I dutifully started collecting. And then I discovered something. When you search 
for guinea pig, sometimes you get something that isn't a guinea pig. You get Papua New Guinea pig. Okay, so this was not a guinea pig. Hmm. So I tried something else, uh, trying to kind of search in a different way, and I got this. Also not a guinea pig, but it turns out that there is a guinea pig club. This was a social and uh, mutual support organization of World War II, uh, a network of British and allied uh, air crew who had been injured uh, in, um, in their planes and had all, and it came about because this group of injured uh, soldiers, airmen, ended up at the Queen Victoria Hospital uh, in Sussex and had undergone experimental treatment for burns, reconstructive surgery uh, because of the burns that they had suffered. And as a way to support themselves and boost their morale, they created this guinea pig club, which continues to meet today and celebrate and support one another. And this um, cover was actually flown in a, an anniversary event uh, of that guinea pig club. And so, of course, I had to add it to my guinea pig collection. But here's the real thing. Uh, yes, they're very cute, cavia porcellus. And as you discover when you begin to uh, research this particular animal, um, we know them as pets, but they are also products and prey uh, in different parts of the world. I also discovered that uh, the Facebook uh, group, there's a Facebook group dedicated to uh, protecting and rescuing guinea pigs from pet mills, uh, breeders who overbreed to the point uh, to provide pets uh, and to make a profit and subject these animals to dire um, and truly horrible living conditions in order to turn out um, uh, pups again and again and again to sell in the pet market. Uh, so I didn't realize that that kind of thing existed for guinea pigs and that made me sad. And so now I'm thinking about this animal in a really different way. Uh, they actually, that name guinea pig it is surmised came about because uh, they were likened to pigs because of the squealing sound they made, but they really suffer from an international identity crisis. In Germany, uh, this animal is called Mierschweinchen, which means little sea pigs, S-E-A. Uh, in France, Lapin du Babre, that means Barbary rabbits. And in Portugal, they're called Porchitas da India, little pigs, from India. But their story really starts, uh, although they've been around as a wild food source for 10,000 years, uh, according to research at University of Otago in New Zealand. The real story starts anywhere from 3,000 to 5,000 years ago. The Incas domesticated them and they used them as pets. Uh, but they also used them as a food source and they sacrificed them to their gods. This particular first day cover uh, shows the pet feature of guinea pigs from a, a set of American uh, US stamps uh, that featured a variety of different pets in 2016. And of course this cover featuring the guinea pig. Uh, but there are stamps from a variety of other countries that tell us about guinea pigs. And this particular uh, mini sheet or souvenir sheet, not sure what you would call this with just the four stamps, but it shows you four different types of guinea pig. Starting in the upper right-hand corner and working clockwise, you have the American guinea pig, uh, down below that, the Abyssinian, and then to its left, the skinny guinea pig, and at the top left, the teddy. Now, the American uh, guinea pig is what we often see in our pet stores, and it's known for its smooth, short coat, and a variety of colors. 
this Abyssinian, isn't that interesting? Its hair grows in rosettes. So it's got this permanent bedhead look, very fashionable. Uh, and this skinny guinea pig, don't you just want to feel sorry for this little thing? It is hairless, that's correct. And so it requires special care because this guinea pig requires heated accommodation and housing because it doesn't have any fur to keep itself warm. And because it also uh, burns up a lot of energy because it's trying to stay warm, it requires a high energy diet uh, that helps it survive and be healthy. And then finally is this Teddy uh, variety of guinea pig, very wiry haired. It's just a halo of fluff. What is not to like about this guinea pig? There are more varieties, and in this um, uh, maximum card, and I'm all deference to Don, who will point out quickly to me that this isn't a true maxi card because it doesn't have a, a correlated pictorial cancel, uh, but it does feature two different kinds of guinea pigs with this, uh, uh, again, with the U.S. stamp. And the, on the left is the American guinea pig we've already talked about. And on the right is called a coronet guinea pig. And it's known for that because at the top of its forehead is this crown of tufted fur. And generally speaking, it has very long hair, much longer than the uh, American guinea pig to its left. But in the bottom right, this Guyana stamp shows you another variety of guinea pig called a silky. And boy, silky is like the guinea pig for all the beautiful hair product commercials you've ever seen. It is hair that requires regular grooming, regular trimming uh, because it's so long and it actually uh, can grow to several inches long. So this is a a bit more uh, effort to take care of a silky uh, if you wind up getting that particular variety. Now, there are many countries, or at least several countries, who have featured guinea pigs on their stamps. Here are two. You see uh, these from North Korea in 1966. Um, this was termed, this uh, mini sheet was called rodents, according to, according to the the Scott uh, catalog and featured what it said was uh, besides the guinea pig, the white mouse and a squirrel. Although I want to debate that because this looks more like a chipmunk to me, but they are referred to as a guinea pig, a white mouse and a squirrel uh, with a, a beautiful landscape uh, poster stamp in the middle of that, of that sheet. Then to the right here, talk about a topical collector's dream. If you collect any animal on a stamp, practically, it's here in this mini sheet uh, from Malta. And this is a, an issue from 2006. You can see the guinea pig in the bottom left corner, but many other beautiful animals on this sheet. So if you are a cats on stamp collector like I am, this is a twofer. Uh, but the, oh, actually, there are, there are two cats on this. So I, I get uh, a lot of joy out of this particular sheet, but I'm always troubled then, do I buy more than one so I can keep it one with each collection or lend the, the sheet to the collection on, uh, other collection periodically? I haven't solved that particular riddle. Here are some other uh, stamps uh, from different countries at the top. Uh, Satanic set of stamps featuring farm animals uh, or um, uh, animals that uh, produce a product for a country. And these are from Ecuador, uh, issued in 2018. Uh, on the bottom row on the left is uh, Benin, and this stamp is from 1983, depicting a guinea pig. In the center, this German issue from 2007 uh, is a semi-postal, and it featured four stamps in the set, each with an, uh, an adult and a juvenile animal, and the additional funding went to support uh, animal welfare 
And so this was a way to raise money to support animals. And then on the right, a 2003 issue from Jersey. Now, they are, uh, as I've said, guinea pigs uh, are products. And what you see up here in the top uh, from Peru uh, is exports, Peruvian exports on stamps. And uh, coffee or coffee beans is one of those exports. And um, so are guinea pigs. Now, you see the name they're using here, C-U-Y, is pronounced Cui, and it is specifically uh, designated as the way to address a guinea pig as food. Uh, it is a staple in Peru's Andean diet and has been for millennia. So I don't know how comfortable I am with that, but I have found images online of recipes, uh, plates featuring cooked guinea pig. Yeah, a little disquieting for a, an American who uh, is used to a guinea pig as a pet. Uh, and this other issue here, uh, Guinea Bissau from 2007, definitely shows guinea pig as prey for this griffin vulture. Uh, so guinea pigs uh, can live a tough life uh, out there. Um, they, they have it pretty good here in America, but in other places, not, not such a happy day for guinea pigs. Now, guinea pigs have been bred for many, many years in our country, and this wonderful uh, cover from 1888 uh, is an advertising cover for uh, William Parham, who was a Massachusetts breeder of pet stock, and you can see that not only did he handle two types of guinea pigs, he also uh, bred ferrets and rabbits, and don't forget uh, the flying squirrels. So here is someone who was breeding guinea pigs for uh, use as pets. But uh, this um, is an interesting cover, or it's a uh, real picture postcard from 1906. And this features uh, someone who was known to people in Bath, England as Guinea Pig Jack. And you can see him on the right there with his guinea pig and his basket uh, on the streets of Bath. Uh, his, this man was actually an Italian. His real name was Domenico uh, Conio, and he performed tricks with guinea pigs and became rather famous on Mavers Street, which is probably where this was taken, uh, and had done uh, done this uh, as a way of raising funds and entertaining children for a good 50 years in Bath, England. So as I close this look at guinea pigs, uh, I want to show you finally this ATM stamp from Portugal that allows you to select a guinea pig on a stamp and dictate what kind of postage rate you need for that stamp and vend it and so the good news there is in Portugal, you can have a guinea pig anytime you want.